Well, good morning, friends. It's so nice to see each one of you here today on this beautiful day. And as Jim mentioned earlier, Pastor H.B. Uh, got up this morning not feeling well, so at 6.10 in the morning I got a phone call from him. And um, I guess they say ministers are to be able to preach, pray, or die at any time. <laughs> Uh, and uh, hopefully we're all ready to die, but sometimes preaching and praying at any moment is not as easy. Well, maybe it is. Hopefully it is. But um, my name is George Smith, and uh, I pastor two of the RV parks during the winter season, Indio Springs RV Resort and also the Rancho Casablanca a former Lawrence Welk Park. And uh, they are located out by Fantasy Springs Casino, but I'm sure none of you know where Fantasy Springs <laughs> Casino is. And in fact, I see we have, uh, I think, about five people from the park here in the service today, and they come here during the summer season. Three of them down here and two back there. So we get to come here. Uh, somewhat during the summer uh, when our parks are not functioning as far as the chapel services go. And you know, earlier they called Barbara, my wife, to play the organ because of Steve and me because of HB. Now, if anybody else gets sick around here, <laughs> I've run out of family members. <laughs> but we trust HB will be back with you next Sunday. I, um, I think you should just turn to that person next to you and say, I am so glad I'm seated next to you today. <laughs> Doesn't that make you feel good? Why don't you turn one more time and say, I know you feel highly honored to be next to me this morning. <laughs> when H.B. called me this morning, of course, my first thought was, uh, what do I speak on? And uh, I thought it was our brother over here who, when he met me this morning, said, I guess you dusted off one to come here. <laughs> <laughs> today. But I thought I'd like to talk you about, to, about, to you about faith. And then I was rather surprised to open the bulletin and see that Pastor H.B. was planning to speak on the subject of faith. And uh, he would be coming at it from a different angle than me. But I would base my message this morning on the 11th chapter of Hebrews. It's a wonderful chapter in the Bible. It talks about all those great people of faith. And also, I think of 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, where it tells us that now three things, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. But always remember, the first one mentioned of the great three is faith. Because without faith, you're not going to have hope. And without faith, you're not going to experience God's love. So when you put that all together, you realize the importance of faith. When we think of faith, we think of it in different ways. For example, we think of the Christian faith. It's the story of God loving the world and Jesus coming and giving his life on our behalf. John 3.16 really gives us a great picture of that. Then another view of faith is our faith, which I believe, or hopefully, I think I have to turn this on for one of the friends. Uh, we think of our faith, which uh, hopefully is the Christian faith. 
Then, then we think of active faith, that uh, faith where we pray for God to answer prayer, uh, the miracle-working faith, to remove the mountains, and uh, we all do that. In fact, we prayed here today for different things. We are exercising our faith. But there's another kind of faith that is very, very important, and this is where I want to focus today. It's what I would call our enduring faith. Faith that doesn't see everything happening the way we would like or hope or pray, but that faith remains. And this is clearly seen in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, for it starts off with all the great things that were accomplished by these men of God, faith. And then you get down in the latter part of the chapter, and it goes on to tell of some who did not receive all of those things. And it describes some who were put to death in rather gory details. The interesting thing is, it takes those individuals and lines them right along with the great people of faith. God's not saying you did not have faith. Verse 39 says, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had plan something better for us so that only together with us they would be made perfect. So here we see a little different view of faith. It's a faith which endures through the toughest things of life. Now this brings up the subject of doubts and questions. When people are really honest, and that's a good Christian virtue, isn't it? When people are honest, they have to admit they've had some doubts. And they have some questions about the Christian faith. Let me give you an example from the pastoral side, because there are times when we think, oh, pastors never face these type of things. But I'll give you a picture from the pastoral side. Here is a young couple. They have gone through seminary, they're ready to go into the ministry. At a special service, they kneel, the presbyters put their hands on them, and pray God's blessing and commission them to the ministry. The warm tears flow down their cheeks. God's called me to preach the gospel to the world and to teach the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. And then they're assigned to a church, probably a small church. That's how ministers start out. And they're not there too long until they face some church politics and budgets and personality conflicts. And... Um, they find very soon that nobody really cares about how well they can translate the Greek New Testament. And then there's the glorification of success that some of the people see on television ministries. And they wonder why it's not happening in our little church. And uh, there's a lot of pressure, <coughs> administrative responsibilities, fundraising, and... Um, this young minister on a Monday is sitting in his little office thinking, this isn't what I pictured when I committed myself to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he sits there very discouraged, contemplating all of these issues. And the warm tears start to go down his cheeks. Not the same as the tears that went down his cheeks at the altar. These are tears of discouragement and pain. And it's a very defining moment in his life 
Will he just pack it up or will he endure? And this is where this enduring faith comes into play. Now, there's another doubt which often happens, might more, uh, more than we would like to admit, and that's spiritual doubt. Have you ever had it cross your mind, what if all of this just isn't true? For example, the church back home, a young girl dies with a strange disease. A young man going home from the youth meeting gets hit by a drunk driver and is a quadriplegic. And then you turn on the news and you hear of all the things that are happening in our world and in the local community, such as what happened here just over a week ago. And you begin to question and you wonder about things. Is God not listening? Will he not bless our efforts? What about this whole Christian faith that we talk about being so great? Or then there's another aspect, and that is where a person struggles with a habitual sin. And they can never seem to conquer this, and they say, if the people in the church knew what I'm doing and what I'm going through, they wouldn't want me around. So these are some of the challenges that people have in their Christian faith. Well, hopefully we can look for some answers on this. You know, the men and women of great faith in the Bible, down through the centuries, entertain doubts. For example, you think of David, who wrote many of the Psalms. There's a little three-letter word which comes up as you read the Psalms. Why? Why, Lord? Why? Just not understanding why. I think of Moses. We think of how great Moses was. And uh, he went out and he killed a fellow. He needed to have anger management classes. That's what he needed. He killed a fellow. And yet, God used him. We think of David, and David had some lust problems. And I'm sure that he went through tremendous struggles in his faith. But the one that really hits me is John the Baptist. You know, one day John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan River. All of a sudden, here came Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And John baptized the Christ. Can you imagine when he went home that night? On the way home, stopped at the new Dunkin' Donuts. and <laughs> He's at home. He's saying, wow, what a baptismal service. I mean, I've never had one like that. I've baptized hundreds of people, and some of them I should have held under longer, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> you enjoyed that, didn't you? Not long after that, he's in prison. And he says to his friends, he says, would you go and check with Jesus and ask him, are you really the Messiah or should we look for somebody else? Oof. The one who had baptized the Lord and had these doubts and questions. Well, it, it really is based on the fact that sometimes it appears like God may, might be having a sabbatical or he's on vacation. And uh, this is where enduring faith comes into play. You see, faith is the conviction, yes, that there ought to be justice, 
that co the conviction that in some larger context there must be some answer. And it, it may be an answer that we won't receive during this lifetime. But there's an answer out there somewhere and in the midst of confusion, there's this profound kind of faith that says, I am not going to toss in the towel. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to walk in obedience to God. For faith is the evidence of things not seen. And uh, this is where we have our faith. We still pursue. It's being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So we look at all the things and then we look at the scriptures and we say, by faith, I take the scriptures and I will walk in obedience to God according to what the scripture says, regardless of what I see out there. Now one of the things that is important in our Christian faith is to have a proper view of God. Sometimes we just don't see God in the proper light. And I believe this is why Jesus portrayed God as a father. I know that there are some people, and maybe some here this morning, that when you reflect on your father, it's not a good story. Maybe he walked out on the family. Maybe you don't even know who your father is. And what I tell people in situations like that is write down what you would consider to be the ideal father. And then remember this, God is even greater than that. God is our father. And when you stop and think of it, a good father doesn't love his child on the basis of, so for example, a boy, whether he is the star quarterback in the high school team or whether he's disabled. That's not the basis. A good father doesn't love his girl on the basis of whether she's the popular, outgoing, charming young woman or someone who struggles with personality issues. A good father loves that child regardless. And that is why when a young man commits a crime, and maybe even a murder, and the parents are sitting in the courtroom, and the crimes are read out, the parents start to weep. Why? They have a parent's heart. And when asked about what their son did, their answer is something like this. You know, we can't, we can't understand what went wrong. He, he's a good kid. He's been a good kid, a good boy. And we just don't understand. And they're as broken up over their son as the other people are over their per family member who's been the victim. Why did they feel that way about their son? Because they have a parent's heart. And Jesus gave the illustration of the prodigal son. And he offended his family greatly. Went off into a far place. Had a wild life. He came to himself and as he came back and the father saw him, the father who was obviously up in society, he didn't care what it looked like. He just grabbed his garments, pulled them up and ran to meet that boy and threw his arms around him and said, you've been lost. 
but you're found. You're home. Let's have a party. You're here. And this gives us a picture of God. And you know, when it comes to the Bible, it uses human terms. God being a father. Yes, it's important to understand our doctrine, our theology, words like God being omniscient, God is omnipresent. I don't, I don't make light of those. It's important to learn and understand all of the various characteristics of God. But the Bible sees God in human terms, and my security as a Christian does not rest in impeccable logic or my ability to remove all doubt. It doesn't rest in the fact that I've got God all figured out. It rests in the fact that he's my father, a loving father, and I have a relationship with him. And that's where it lies. And here's an important thought. I believe that we all need to come to the point where they, we can say, I will hold my logic and suspend my judgment until God can explain it to me someday. You know, the Bible has a verse which reminds me of, say you're over on Hollywood Boulevard, and a big stretch limo goes by with dark windows and you can see figures in there, you know people are in there, or you're back in Washington, D.C., and you see the big car go by and you wonder who's in there. Is it Hillary or Donald? <laughs> you just wonder who's in there. But the Bible says now we see through a glass darkly, or a dark glass. But someday, someday, we will see face to face. And that's when we'll understand some of the things we've gone through in life. That doesn't mean that we want an explanation for, that we don't want an explanation for the young girl who had the strange disease or the boy who became a paraplegic or whatever. But we concede that God is bigger than our ability to understand everything. And it's a wonderful place, wonderful time, when you can come to the place that you say, I have to be on speaking terms with God. He often calms my doubts and my fears, not with an explanation, but with a touch of his Holy Spirit and his word. I was 27, Barbara and I were in the ministry, we were on our way to take the lead pastor role at a suburban church in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. It was December the 31st, we were in Minneapolis, it was a Sunday night. Minneapolis is a great city, but not my favorite place, December 31st. It was cold, very cold. There was a church I'd always wanted to go to there, and we went to the service. And at the end of the service, I learned that the previous day at noon hour, my father had been killed in a car accident. My two brothers were in it, and the one they weren't sure he would live, which thank God he did. As a young minister, that's pretty devastating news. We'd booked in a motel out in the east side of St. Paul. And uh, I couldn't sleep that night. We had our three-year-old son, so Barbara and Mark went to bed. And finally, about four, I said, let's get on the road. But I arrived back where my father and mother lived, Peterborough, Ontario, Canada east of Toronto. Well, what do you say to a mother who's suddenly become a widow? There was no preparation for this. She was 55, and my two brothers were still in college. 
overwhelming. Some of you maybe have faced that, I'm sure. And it was time for the service. And my father had been traveling by train each week to Montreal to fill in in the church. He was a Bible college president to fill in in, a, in the church where I would pastor. But this last weekend, because it was uh, New Year's weekend, he said to my brothers, hey, why don't you guys come? We'll drive down there. And they were hit by a drunken driver. So <clears throat> came time for the service. And it all was so confusing to me as a young minister. Why, why, why? I can un identify with David. I went into the back bedroom and I knelt down and I recommitted myself to the Lord and his ministry. And I said, oh Lord, I will never allow bitterness to find a, a birthplace in my life over this issue. And I got up off my knees I felt a wonderful sense of God's presence and assurance that he was with me. You know, in the last book of Joshua, it talks about stones that were set as a witness or a memorial. And in the Old Testament, there are places where they met God and they built an altar. It was remembrance. And in our lives, we find that there are some of those stones, those altars where God met us. And when we're going through the deep waters and we're confused, it's the time to reflect back. That is where God met us. That's where God met me. And the song that became very real to me at that time was a song that gospel soloist would sing and the chorus went like this it's real it's real oh I know it's real praise God my doubts are settled I know I know it's real and if you're going through going through a tough time I would suggest reflect back to a moment when God did something great for you and the reality of that. And know that the God who is with you then is the God who is with you today. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that our faith can be grounded in you and, and we have deep trust in you. And some people here today are no doubt going through some struggles. And I pray that somehow you would meet them in a very special manner. May they recognize that you promised never to leave, never to forsake. You didn't say we would have all the answers, but you have said you will always be with us. And for any here today who have never placed faith in Christ Jesus, may this be the moment to say, Lord Jesus, I believe I receive you in Christ's name. Amen.